Hello, everyone. This is Actin Lab live stream number 40.2 on March 24th, 2022. Welcome to the Actin Lab. We're a participatory online lab that is communicating, learning, and practicing applied active inference. This is a recorded and an archived live stream. So please provide us with feedback so we can improve our work, hear about your QRF. All backgrounds and perspectives are welcome. We may actually have to change this to all QRF are welcome. And we'll follow video etiquette for live streams. Check out activeinference.org to learn more about the activities in the lab. Today in 40.2, we are continuing to learn and discuss this awesome paper, A Free Energy Principle for Generic Quantum Systems by uh, Fields, Friston, Glazebrook, and Levin. And we're really appreciative to have several of the authors joining us today. And in this dot two, we're just going to have introductions and then jump right in to several of the notes that we left for ourselves from last time and see where else it goes. And anyone can write a comment in the live chat and we'll just say hello again, pick up with some threads that were left unspooled in the dot one and see where we get in the dot two and how we continue going forward. So I'm Daniel, I'm a researcher in California and I will pass it to Dean. Morning, my name's Dean, I'm in uh, Calgary in Canada. My emphasis I think is on the practice part of active inference and uh, seeing how it gets applied in, in uh, different contexts and situations. I'll pass it to Blue. I'm Blue Knight. I'm an independent researcher in New Mexico, and I will uh, be facilitating the discussion today. But let me pass it off to, oh, Stephen, if he's still here. Stephen, are you here? Oh, you're muted, Stephen. We still don't hear you. Okay. Thanks, Stephen. We'll, we'll continue on Thanks. to Dave. <laughs> Dave, I don't see. Also left. Okay. Okay. Let's continue. To let's pass it go. on to, to the authors we go. So uh, let's pass it to Mike first, since you have audio this time. Yes, hi. Uh, yep, this is uh, Mike Levin. Um, I uh, do biology at Tufts, uh, trying to uh, understand what uh, what living systems are doing at all scales and how uh, intelligence manifests in various um, unconventional uh, embodiments across, uh, and, and they compete in, and cooperate across scales to give us the amazing phenomena we see in biology. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Dave, would you like to say hello, introduce yourself? Maybe no audio also. Okay, how about Carl? Would you like to say hello? Yes, I would. Hello. <laughs> I'm Carl. Uh, I'm one of the co-authors on the paper. I'm a neuroscientist from London. Um, I have to confess I'm a bit of a passenger and admirer of this paper. So I'm here to learn as much to, <laughs> as to answer questions. So I'll pass it on to Chris, who's... Uh, Hi, I'm Chris Fields. I'm also an independent researcher, uh, working sort of on the boundaries between physics and biology and information science, and uh, sort of convinced that those are all three the same actual discipline. <laughs> so this is a, a paper that expands on that theme a little bit. Great. Thank you. So I think where we left off last time was talking about how the FEP is asymptotically the principle of unitarity. And maybe Chris, would you mind leading us off um, here? And if you wanna point out a specific, maybe formalism or um, place where we should start. I think it was the very last formalism in the, in the paper actually. Um, but maybe if you would talk us through that, that would be super appreciated. 
Okay. Um, well, let's let's talk first informally, just about um, the motivation for this idea and how it might make sense intuitively. And again, I'll go back to uh, Carl's paper from 2019, a free energy principle for a particular physics, which, which the current paper is obviously modeled after in a certain way. And as we discussed last time, I think, uh, what Carl was able to show in particular physics was that the idea of the very intuitive idea of a thing, of something that exists and um, importantly ma maintains its identity as a single system over time. And what that means is that it's, it can be measured by some other system. Uh, and it can be measured repeatedly and reliably uh, over time by some other system. So, so thingness is associated with repeated measurability. And what Carl was able to show in, in particular physics was that if we assume that something is a thing, then we're effectively assuming that it, it has a stable non-equilibrium steady state density. And therefore, we're assuming that it has a Markov blanket. And therefore, we can treat it as implementing active inference, as uh, constantly predicting its own future existence and behaving so as to make that prediction come true to the extent that it can. And uh, such behavior may be prevented or overcome by its environment. So the environment of something uh, may cause it to cease to exist. Uh, you know, the thing could be a marble sitting on a table and its environment could include a sledgehammer that's about to come down on top of it and, and destroy its thingness. Uh, but as long as the environment doesn't do that, uh, the, the object can continue to, uh, to execute active inference and maintain its Markov blanket by so doing. And of course, its Markov blanket is what defines it as a separate entity, as a thing that's distinct from its environment. So let's translate all of that into quantum theory. Uh, in quantum theory, we have this uh, notion of interaction as measurement already. And we have a notion of interaction as information exchange already. So it's very natural to uh, take this whole picture and, and, and make the notion of measurement over time precise in this using this quantum theoretic formalism and quantum theory also gives us a a very natural implementation of a markov blanket uh, which in physics is called a holographic screen and holographic screens were introduced back in the 70s to talk about black holes uh, but a holographic screen is, is just a reformulation of the concept of a Markov blanket. It's, it's a boundary that encodes information. And specifically, it's a boundary between two systems that encodes all of the information that one system can have about the other. So um, it does just what a Markov blanket does. It, provides an information encoding boundary that gives the systems on the two sides of it identities for each other by distinguishing them. And this notion of identity in quantum theory corresponds to separability. Separability just means lack of entanglement. So if the joint, if you have a two things, 
or a thing in its environment, then if they're not entangled, you can talk about their states independently. If they are entangled, then you can't talk about their states independently. And so the idea of thingness goes away, since thingness uh, implies having some sort of conditionally independent state, right? A nest density that can actually be written down. So all of this fits together rather nicely. And so if we go back to particular physics, uh, the idea of active inference uh, emerges from that paper as a fundamental underlying principle of physics that, that tells us what we mean by thing or system that's identifiable over time. So this, is, this becomes a very deep principle, uh, deeper than Newton's laws, because Newton's laws actually talk about objects that are identifiable over time. And the, 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 uh, the free energy principle and the idea of active inference tells us what we mean when we talk about something being identifiable over time. So if this is a if this is a fundamental principle of physics, then one would expect that it would have some relationship to the principle of unitarity, which is the most fundamental principle of quantum theory. And is, is typically axiom one when one writes down the axioms of quantum theory. Uh, was was axiom one in von Neumann's formulation back in the 30s, uh, or 40s, I can't remember which. So what's the principle of unitarity? The principle of unitarity is just the principle that in a closed system, information is conserved. So information is neither created nor destroyed in a closed system. So it's a fundamental conservation law, and it's exactly analogous to the principle of conservation of energy. Right, the conservation of energy says, in a closed system, energy is neither created nor destroyed. It's conserved. So the principle of unitarity just says this for information as well as energy. And we know that information and energy are very closely linked uh, by, by Landauer's principle or by uh, Boltzmann's uh, definition of entropy or all of these other connections that, that make physics informational. So how does the principle of active inference relate to the principle of unitarity? What does it say about um, the conservation of information? Or what does the conservation of information tell us about the principle of, um, the principle of active inference or the free energy principle? Well, the first thing to know is that unitarity applies to closed systems. So, so thing environment pairs. Um, and active inference characterizes what the thing is doing in response to its environment. And of course, it also characterizes what the environment is doing in response to the thing. Uh, and another benefit of quantum theory is that it makes this symmetry between any system and its environment uh, manifest. It makes it very explicit. Uh, but it's already explicit in the free energy principle. I mean, the Markov blanket has two sides. And uh, the, the system acting on its environment is the same as the environment sensing the system and in the same way that the environment acting on the system is the same as the system sensing its environment. So interaction, physical interaction is information exchange in both frameworks and, and it's perfectly symmetrical. Uh, if the system remains identifiable over time, so does its environment. To exist, its environment ceases to exist. 
because its environment is defined with respect to it. That's why we call it its environment. Um, so, so all of these all of these symmetries are built into both frameworks. So um, the free energy principle is fundamentally about prediction, right? VFE variational free energy can be thought of as prediction error or potential prediction error. So the free energy principle is about the system being able to predict the next state of its own Markov blanket. Uh, and if it predicts the next state of its own Markov blanket perfectly, then VFE is minimized to zero. And that's the asymptotic case, perfect prediction. And there was a question last time about what's asymptotic in the, in the claim that the free energy principle is asymptotic with the principle of unitarity. And the asymptotic state, as I think Blue pointed out last time, is perfect prediction. So and now let's translate all this to quantum theory. And this is where the figure in the paper that shows the disk with the various triangles uh, comes into play. I think that's figure six, but I've actually forgotten. Uh, yeah, it's, it's that one. So let's now introduce this idea of a QRF, which is just a little package of predictive capability. <laughs> Uh, QRF means quantum reference frame. Uh, as we discussed last time, a reference frame is uh, implemented computation that makes a measurement comparable across time. So uh, a meter stick, for example, implements a computation of length, and it allows us to compare measurements of length across time uh, because we assume that it's fixed and of course we can use a meter stick because each of us has embedded in our brains a representation of length uh, in fact we have a representation of a 3d coordinate system uh, without which meter states would be useless so we can use external reference frames like meter sticks because we have internal reference frames like our representation of 3D space and our intuitive understanding of length uh, that we assume stays fixed over time and that allows our measurements of length to be comparable across time for us. So now let's think about a QRF uh, as a way of, of as something that implements active inference or that enables a system to implement active inference by allowing it to compare its measurements over time, right? Prediction is meaningless if you can't compare your measurements over time. Um, so, and let's ask, what, what would it be like for a system to be able to perfectly predict the next state of its Markov blanket. Well, the next state of its Markov blanket is a state that its environment has written by acting on it. So um, our question of perfect prediction is, what, what would it be like for a system to be able to perfectly predict the next actions of its environment? And notice that the system isn't predicting the next state of its environment. It doesn't know the state of its environment. State of its environment's on the other side of the Markov blanket. What it's trying to predict is the next action of its environment on it, which is the only action of its environment that's relevant. Uh, and the only action of the environment that's detectable. <laughs> so um, its environment, like it, is characterized by QRFs, right? The situation is perfectly symmetrical between the system and its environment. Um, so the question of predicting its environment, and the system can predict its environment's actions perfectly, only if it and the environment exactly share their QRFs, because the QRF not only 
interprets sensation. It gives meaning to action. So it says what your action is going to be. So if I use my meter stick to cut a two by four, my QRF, the meter stick, is guiding my action. It's giving it meaning. It's making it repeatable in the same way that it makes my perceptions repeatable. And again, that's, that's why we use these things. We want to be able to act in repeatable ways as well as perceive in repeatable ways. And if we can't act in repeatable ways, then again, the notion of prediction becomes meaningless. So, um, perfect prediction corresponds to perfect QRF alignment. So the question becomes now, what does perfect QRF alignment correspond to? And uh, Jim Glazebrook and another colleague, Antonino Marciano, uh, who's a, physis a physicist in Shanghai, uh, showed in a previous paper that perfect, perfect QRF alignment between a system and its environment is only possible if the system and environment are entangled. So perfect QRF alignment corresponds actually to the collapse of the Markov blanket because it corresponds to the collapse of separability, which means that the ness is no longer well-defined because it's no longer an ind a conditionally independent state. And you can see that if you think of what perfect QRF alignment means. It means that your actions correspond exactly to my predictions. A conditional statement, it's an exact statement. So if I predict that you're going to do X, then you're going to do X, period. Uh, which means that your state is no longer independent of my state. Your state actually depends on my state. And my state, correspondingly, actually depends on your state. If you predict that I'm going to do X, then I will do X. That's what perfect prediction means. Uh, when we translate it into this uh, QRF-based concept. So perfect prediction and uh, the collapse of separability are the same thing. So the asymptotic limit of the FEP, which is perfect prediction, corresponds to the collapse of separability. Well, the collapse of separability is just entanglement. <laughs> and the principle of unitarity is the claim that any isolated system left to its own devices uh, will evolve its state, which is the joint state of any two of its components, will evolve toward, toward uh, complete entanglement. It will evolve toward a pure state in, in quantum theoretic jargon. So uh, it's in this sense that the FEP is asymptotically the principle of unitarity. It's that it, its asymptotic condition is the same as the condition that the principle of unitarity imposes on closed systems, i.e. on system environment combinations. Where whenever I say environment, I, I just mean everything that exists that's not the system of interest. Uh, so a system environment combination is always a closed system by definition. So, so that's my introduction, and uh, we can start on discussion. That's great. Thank you. Stephen, did you have a question? Yes, you can hear me okay. Excellent. Uh, I was just going to ask, that's really helpful. Uh, there's a lot in there, obviously. <laughs> I was going to ask, in terms of the pure unitarity, would that be what happens, say, at the electron or the kind of these normal quantum particle scales and as you go to scales above that you it becomes more and more approximate you have less of this uh 
isotropic, you know, this, this, this quality of knowing and entanglement. Um, well, that, that's, that's a very deep question, and it's a very good question. Uh, let's think about the, the, the canonical entanglement experiment, experiment, the sort of Bell EPR experiment. Uh, so I'll, I'll draw it with my hands here. <laughs> so in the canonical experiment, you've got a source, and it's located here in the, in the middle of my face. And it produces an entangled pair of something, photons or electrons or buckyballs or whatever you want. And they travel apart at the speed of light or something very close to it. And at some point, they encounter two symmetrically placed detectors. And the detectors are operated by observers who are always called Alice and Bob. And uh, these detectors measure something, and in the canonical experiment, they measure spin. And what Alice and Bob each observe independently is a random distribution of spins. And if we think of this as a two-dimensional experiment, then um, they, they either measure spin up or spin down in some coordinate system. So... Alice and Bob each pick a z-axis that defines up, and with respect to their local z-axis, they see a random distribution of up and down. Now, um, things get interesting when Alice and Bob later get together and compare their results. And what they find is that whenever Alice observes up, Bob observes down and vice versa. And so they conclude that their results are classically correlated. But then it gets more interesting because what we allow Alice and Bob to do is constantly alter the direction that they detect the spin in with respect to their own local z-axis. So you can think of the spin detector as like a polarization filter, so like a pair of sunglasses. And what Alice and Bob can do is randomly and independently change the tilt of their sunglasses um, while they do this experiment. And in, in real implementations of this experiment, it was first implemented sorry, by... Um, Alan Aspect in his lab in Paris in the early 1970s. Um, and has since been repeated probably hundreds of times by different groups all over the world, including the Chinese using a satellite to generate the entangled pairs and measuring them thousands of, a, a thousand or so kilometers apart. Um, so if you remember the speed of lights, a foot per nanosecond, so you've got a lot of nanoseconds in there if you're a thousand kilometers apart to play with. And the so the, the trick in this experiment is that Alice and Bob can change the direction of their detector within the time it takes for the entangled pair to get from the source to the detectors. So if it takes 10 nanoseconds, to get from the source to the detectors, they have to be able to change their detectors within 10 nanoseconds. So that's why you want detectors that are far apart. So Alice and Bob redo the experiment, changing randomly changing the directions that they're measuring uh, with respect to their local z-axis. And then they get together again to compare their results. And what they find is that um, if Alice observes up, Bob will observe down uh, even when they've been randomly and independently changing the directions of their detectors. So uh, one way to put that is if Alice decides to rotate her detector 45 degrees, 
then Bob's result will automatically be rotated 45 degrees. And it's symmetrical, so vice and vice versa. So that's not classical correlation. That's classical correlation that's robust against manipulation. So uh, I was discussing this with Carl a while back, and I used this example. Uh, if you and I are, classic, are classically correlated, then we may have the same beliefs about something. So uh, we might both believe that the Earth is round. That's classical correlation. Uh, now, suppose someone convinces me that the Earth is flat. If, if that happens and you then believe that the Earth is flat, that's entanglement. That's classical correlation that's robust against manipulation. So it's, it's correlation, no kidding. Uh, correlation that, that survives the environment doing something to you. And so uh, now let's go back to this question. Is this, is this an effect that only occurs in some microscopic domain? And the answer is, it's an effect that was first described by a theory that was intended to only describe a microscopic domain. Right? Quantum theory was developed to deal with nuclear and atomic and nuclear physics. And so there's this idea of the quantum world, which is very small. But the math, of course, applies across the board. And trying to think of quantum theory, trying to think of classical physics as a limit, a mathematical limit of quantum theory, always runs into problems. And the problems are always that numbers go to infinity that shouldn't be infinity. So it's not really accurate to think of classical physics as some sort of mathematical limit like h-bar goes to zero uh, of quantum theory, because if h-bar goes to zero, lots of relevant energies go to infinity. Um, and this, is, this has been known for a long time. Nonetheless, it's, it's constantly taught in this classical limit kind of framework that isn't really correct. Um, so one point of um, doing Bell EPR experiments at larger and larger distances is to demonstrate that quantum theory is not really a microscopic theory. Uh, so if you think of an entangled state, an entangled state is one object. It's not two electrons that happen to have some mysterious relationship. It's one object that has one state. Remember what entanglement means is non-separability, non-independence across any decompositional boundary. So an entangled pair is one thing. And what the Chinese were able to demonstrate uh, was you can have one quantum object that's over a thousand kilometers long. Now that's not microscopic. That's big. Uh, a nice way to think about entanglement was introduced by Leonard Susskind uh, quite a few years ago and Raphael Busso uh, with their idea that uh, an entangled pair is the same thing as an Einstein-Rosen bridge in space-time. And an Einstein-Rosen bridge is a black hole and a white hole connected end to end. Or you can think of it that way. It's, it's a topological connection in space-time that simply identifies two points in space-time that would otherwise be considered distinct. So this emphasizes that uh, if you have an entangled pair, there's no distance inside it. Uh, if you have two entangled electrons, for example, that are a thousand kilometers apart, as far as they're concerned, they're right next to each other. And in fact, 
as far as they're concerned, they're located at exactly the same point in space-time. And that's what this ER bridge notion emphasizes to us. Uh, that there's really no separation here, that the separation is an artifact of our observational capabilities. It's not a characteristic of the entangled state. So entanglement actually calls into question what the idea of distance even means. Uh, it makes it, it forces it to be relative to us. And that's, that's, that's why there's all this discussion of emergent space-time in quantum gravity, in quantum cosmology. Because if you think about things from a straight quantum theory point of view, uh, space-time is an observable. It's, it's just something, it's, an, it's something that's relative to how an observation is made. It's not an intrinsic property of anything. It's not ontic, as they say. Um, so, let's go back to this question again. Um, if we think about entanglement, and we think about observation, uh, and we think about entanglement as something that's observed by comparing observations made by different observers, right? Neither Alice nor Bob in that experiment can detect entanglement. Uh, they only realize that there's an entangled state when they talk to each other after they've done the experiment. Uh, then this question of scale becomes a question about how observers interact and what observers can know about each other and about each other's experimental apparatus. So when I described the the entanglement experiment, I said, Alice and Bob each have their own local z-axis. And when they get together and they discuss their results, and they compare their results, then they make a very important assumption, which is the assumption that their z-axes are comparable. So if during the experiment, Bob's z-axis was varying at random with respect to Alice's z-axis, then their results, comparing their results would be meaningless because they'd be measured with respect to completely different reference frames. Um, so we have to make this assumption that they have the same z-axis. Now, interestingly enough, that assumption by itself uh, tells you that Alice and Bob have to be entangled, or their z axes have to be entangled. So, uh, the idea of entanglement kind of expands to take in all aspects of the experimental situation as soon as one starts unearthing these assumptions that we make to um, talk about comparability between experiments. So let's reel the tape back about half an hour, <laughs> and we see that, that quantum reference frames are what make experiments comparable for uh, an observer. It's similarity or comparability of quantum reference frames that make comparing experiments possible for two observers. Uh, but if the two observers exactly share their QRFs in a way that's robust against environmental manipulation, then they're entangled. <laughs> so we've kind of come full, full circle here. Uh, it's one one can make this notion of entanglement as macroscopic as one likes. And again, this is, um, in a sense, why, why quantum gravity and quantum cosmology are interesting. Uh, it's what drives things like the black hole information paradox, which you may have read about. Um, so, so, so we're now getting into, in a sense, very fundamental physics. How, how do we uh, 
what's the relationship between entanglement and the concept of space-time? What's the relationship between quantum theory and, and general relativity? Um, which is, you know, the big the big question in in physics from one point of view. Um, but the short answer is you can make entanglement as big as you want. That's great. Thank you. Um, that actually leads into a question that I had back way back when we were talking about entanglement and quantum reference frames. Um, so I was just thinking, like, if I cannot perfectly predict my own behavior, is my quantum reference frame, like, incompletely aligned with my own quantum reference frame? Like, I, I mean, maybe we've all had the experience of, you know, predicting if I kick a ball in this way, I predict it'll go over there, but like, it doesn't actually go over there. So like, I mean, we predict and we're off. Our prediction is is not accurate. So is it like the, actually a temporal separation that that like makes that happen? Or or what do you think happens in those circumstances where, where my QRF appears unaligned with my own QRF? No, that's also that's also a beautiful deep question, and it it points to something that I think uh, can and should be stated as a general theorem, which is uh, no system can perfectly predict can perfectly predict its own state. Uh, no system can observe its own state, its own total state. Uh, so, uh, so that situation is um, ubiquitous and unavoidable, <laughs> and uh, one could phrase it by saying, uh, a system can have a a QRF or a metaprocessor, as one often uses that vocabulary, that represents itself. So we all have a self representation um, that's, in a sense, metacognitive. Uh, we claim to know what we believe and things like that. Um, but of course, those beliefs are all, uh, one, very coarse grained, uh, two, extremely incomplete. Uh, three, useful for making predictions, but they're often wrong. And, you know, this, this is, uh, this, po this point has had huge technological consequences. I mean, think back to the history of artificial intelligence, right? In the 70s, uh, there was the, the huge new wave was expert systems. And you know, AI people d redefine themselves as knowledge engineers who are going to go out and interview experts and find out how experts did things and code it up in computers. And soon we'd have you know, artificial expert systems that did anything interesting. And that whole business failed utterly. Right? It was a complete disaster. It didn't work at all. Why? Well, the, the simple explanation for why is that experts can't tell you what they're doing. Expertise isn't verbalizable. And it's not just expert piano playing isn't verbalizable. You know, expert systems engineering isn't verbalizable. Expert computer programming isn't verbalizable. Uh, and that's, that's just an illustration of the fact that our metaprocessors don't actually have a complete model of the rest of us, much less a model of the rest of us plus the metaprocessor. Uh, so it all, it all comes back to this general principle that a system can't represent itself, and so it can't predict its own behavior. Awesome. So between this work... Actually, I should ask Carl to comment on that tirade 
because he's also thought about this an extraordinary amount. Well, I'll certainly make the comment that um, that, that was marvellous. You know, I'm glad this has been recorded because this should certainly be transcribed. And uh, I know it's probably um, implicit in the paper, but it was so beautifully articulated and, cl and clear, taking us through the issues. I, I, I really enjoyed that. Um, so I, I have loads of comments, but I won't, I won't waste people's time uh, going through all of them. Uh, that last issue is is, is um, really interesting about sort of the metaprocessor or the metacognitive aspects or a system being able to measure itself. I mean, there's a fundamental observation there. That of course, you know, um, you can't measure yourself. I mean, you know, the, the whole point of the particular physics paper was to say that you know, yes, there can be two kinds of information geometries, if you like, um, and the big move is that one system can measure, i.e., infer by possessing or having a movement on in some sort of information geometry, infer um, and belief update about something else. So at no point is there any room for it to st they also start to infer about its own inference. That, 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 that is uh, you know, that's a, a mathematical impossibility from, from the random dynamical system perspective. I'm not so sure about the uh, the quantum perspective, but it sounds as though that's also true. So that begs the question, um, how on earth do we have the illusion um, that we know ourselves? Um, and of course, you know, it's a little bit of a, um, a colloquial question because you know, 99.9% .9 of things don't, don't actually uh, think that they know themselves. So unless there's a particular phenotype particle um, or species that boasts philosophers, I'm pretty sure that most of the things that exist uh, don't have any uh, any pretense to, to thinking that they know themselves. It's a really interesting um, point to get across. Anecdotally, uh, you know, I spend a lot of time um, taking people through examples that probably go right back to things like idea motor theory. Um, that you know, the way that we um, the way that we develop a sense of agency and think that we have a sense of agency, you know, is, is a gift and illusion that is probably unique to only a small number of us and may not even be available to people with, say, severe autism. Um, and the, you know, the example that I've literally in the past day just written down in a didactic way was that if you just take um, vanilla active inference under a Markov blanket, and then you um, look at particular kinds of sparsity structures where the active states of the Markov blanket or the holographic screen are hidden from the internal state. So these are special kinds of systems that have a particular sparsity where now the active states of the Markov blanket are now become hidden from the internal states. And you can certainly license some entanglement, um, and I would, um, I, I'm going to later ask about the relationship between entanglement and synchronization. So I'll say entanglement or synchronization of the internal states, such that the internal states have beliefs about the, their action, but those beliefs become beliefs about action as a hidden cause. So there's absolutely no notion from the inside that you cause that, you're just representing the cause. So the example I have in mind is you're watching a little fish swimming around, looking for food, gobbling up little bits of particles of food. And you think, oh, that's a very sort of um, artful fish with purpose and pragmatics and knows how to navigate its world. Um, but from the point of view of the fish, all that is happening is that the water and the particles are moving around it in a benevolent, nurturing, and fortuitous way such that the water is delivering food particles to the fish's mouth. So from the fish's point of view, it has absolutely no awareness that it is the author or the agent that's causing this synchronization with the environment. So you know, the, the, the deeper question is, how on earth do we have the illusion that we think we know our own, our own agency? And how would, and when do we develop agency? And you know, furthermore, it's not just agency about me, it's agency about other things. At what point do our uh, 
uh, in our, say, early neonatal neurodevelopment, do we have these models of the world that enable us to distinguish between mother and self? You know, and at what point do we align our QRFs, if you like, with not mother, but with the world um, that enables us to now see mother as an independent object? Uh, so that is something else that is an agent and you know the argument would then be well perhaps if mother is an agent perhaps i am an agent and then you develop it, <coughs> that i am now the author of my agency and my actions but that is such a, you know that's such a high level thing i imagine it only pertains to you know to, to, to humans that's what that's what i had said I'd, I'd love to talk about um um the, the homologues of entanglement from the point of view of classical thinking. But perhaps I've, I've spoken enough at this point. Um, just a couple of things uh, came came to my mind uh, listening to this. Um, what, one is that uh, Josh Bongard had this uh, amazing uh, paper in uh, I think it was around uh, two thousand six or so, where he had these robots and these they were they started out like uh, six legged starfish. But the the cool thing about it was that they didn't have an internal model of what they were and or what their shape is or how to move, and they basically had to flop around and make make models of. Uh, their own structure based on what happened to them given various outputs that they generated and eventually they would build a, a model of what happens and they would walk around and so on and two interesting things followed one is that you could un unlike traditional robotics you could rip off one of the legs and they would very soon revise the model and keep going in different ways so they weren't tied to that particular self model right they would have to discover it from scratch but it was still sort of plastic throughout their whole lifetime and they could they could get along so they had that plasticity and the other thing is that and um chris uh, christoph adami wrote a nice uh, kind of uh, interpretation piece of this he he described they, they they spent lots of um lots of time being completely inactive and basically running through uh, quote unquote mentally running through all the different things that they could do and what they think was going to happen uh, before they actually moved and so uh, Chris uh, called that uh, dreaming you know that they would basically sort of play out uh, before you know in, in between their actual motions where they would go around testing and they would actually sort of play this out internally and try to refine the model such that then when they do move they would actually make movements that uh, maximally sort of distinguish the different different possible models and so on and he said you know he said that you can watch them dreaming about about their shape um, so and, and then the other thing I just wanted to briefly mention this 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 idea of uh, when and how do you recognize that you're an agent and that actually you need to act for things to happen versus just having the environment do things to you I, I suspect that one of the things that drives it very early on is this is this notion of stress and i, I don't have a particular uh, I, I don't have a theory of, of why stress feels stressful but but just on a purely functional level i think that what happens in in cells you know so, so very early long before you get to humans or anything like that i think that what you get is this um this the set, a set of mechanisms that that evolved from things like uh, stress about protein folding and so on, but then then basically scaled up to be stress about metabolics and stress about morphology and stress about behavioral issues and and so on. That basically is a is a system wide metric of um, the delta between what's going on and what you'd like to have going on. Right, the, the delta between your your set point and and what's happening now. And what then I think that drives a strengthening of this uh, of, of, of the agency model, because what will happen is as you as you as you slowly learn that you can do things that reduce the stress level, it kind of solidifies this idea that it's actually at least some amount of it is up to you to make life better. And, and so you then then act. And then, of course, we know that breaks down and sort of learn helplessness assays and so on. That's that's that, that, that really is, is very traumatic for, for all kinds of creatures well below human. Can I can I speak to that? Because there's some great points there. Please. Yeah. Um, so three really important uh, things being brought to the table there. Um, so I'm bound to forget the third one if I start the first. But I just want to. So I'm coming back to Blue's um, question about sort of a um, QRS and alignment, and that and you know one obvious answer that um, one could bring to the table is that learning is the alignment of the QRS. So learning at all scales, you know, and we're talking here about developmental scales, for example, we're talking about 
robots that learn to repair themselves or learn their new QRFs. Um, if you remove a limb or a child learning to um, make sense of its world, then um, you could look at the slow process of alignment of the QRFs, the things that are invariant over the faster timescales at which there is classic information exchange on or in um, the holographic uh, screen as simply um, a um, movement from a state of um, disentanglement to a state of entanglement um, as you become better and better at predicting. But to become better at predicting, you have to align your QRS and you have to to, to align that. Um, I think the, sort of the robot example is a, perfect, uh, a nice illustration of that in the sense that these robots were equipped with um, the ability to learn about themselves. And of course, the, you know, the analog um, in developmental psychology, and indeed, I would imagine, developmental neurobotics um, is motor babbling. It's basically you know, soliciting um, outcomes, sensory outcomes, in order to start to disambiguate between what did I cause that or did you cause that? You know, what parts are apparently under my control? But of course, you know, that's a very anthropomorphic interpretation. There's no minus or minus implicit, but certainly the learning of the world models and the, the body models um, is probably the first thing that any artifact has to contend with. And of course, you see that in children, you know, shaking their rattle to, to um, um, solicit and um, actively solicit the conjunction of visual motion, um, proprioceptive feedback from the muscles causing the movement of the mobile or the lateral and the auditory. So soliciting uh, conjunctions or correlations that are explainable and predictable um, in multiple modalities. So you may then ask, well, why on earth? What is the imperative for that kind of behavior? What drives action to solicit this um, opportunity to um, learn the, the correlations and the coincidences and the conjunctions? Um, and that brings us to the second point. Um, um, the, the, um, these robots dreaming tell you immediately that at some level they have an internal model um, of the consequences of action. Uh, and that tells you immediately that you've got, um, if you wanted to write that down from the point of view of classical active inference, you've got a, um, a belief structure on the inside that covers both the, con but covers both the external world and these hidden actions and the actions upon the, uh, on the world and the consequences of those actions on the external states. That's a very sophisticated generative model to have. And you're getting now into the world of, of planning as inference. So a thermostat won't, won't, doesn't have that. And yet th these robots do have that. So it tells you that the, there are two natural kinds of particles or Markov blankets or separable systems. Um, at least two kinds, one of which is more like a thermostat and one of which is more like um, um, a sort of, um, I was thinking a sort of like an Ashby um, um, homeostat or allostat, uh, but certainly more like these sort of uh, robots that can learn about, about themselves. And the, cu and, the, and the crucial distinction, I think, is that the agent has now started to represent the consequences of its actions, but without realizing it's its own actions. We still haven't got to the level of the other metacognitive I am aware kind of, kind of artifact. And it, interestingly, it comes back to um, what I was saying before about natural kinds where one's active states are hidden from the internal state. So they have to become inferred. You have to infer them. They're not, they're not, they are opaque to the internal states. And as soon as you say it like that, then you're naturally talking about systems that um, can effectively uh, uh, engage in planning as inference. So they have to have plans in their heads uh, in order to act, which you know, corresponds to, to, uh, to this dreaming. And from the point of view of the, uh, uh, the, free, the active inference, um, then you ask, well, what are the objective functions um, or what are the principles of least action that would um, 
apply to these kinds of plans. And when you work it through, then one important component of the, um, the sort of the, the pathogens or the actions in question is a drive to resolve uncertainty. So we come back to this notion of the child soliciting proprioceptive, extraceptive um, um, sensations that enable it to resolve uncertainty. And this is exactly the same principle behind the optimal Bayesian design, that we design experiments that are going to resolve the uncertainty to the greatest extent possible under our current internal models or hypotheses about how the world works. And that brings me to the third great point uh, about stress uh, and the the really important um, um, place of stress and uncertainty and angst and not knowing what to do next or not knowing what's going to work in driving behavior. Because if a large chunk of the imperatives for planned action is to maximize information gain or um, minimize expected surprisal or reduce uncertainty, then you can see easily now why it is situations of uncertainty and stress that will necessarily uh, cause the most um, epistemic uh, responses in order to drive the system or the, the uh, in this instance, the agent um, to resolve that uncertainty. The final point now, and this is basically paraphrasing what Mike just said, if the system sees itself behaving more in times of greater uncertainty, it may now learn that and, and now have the idea, oh, I am the kind of system, or I am behaving as if I am the kind of system that responds more when under stress. And then you'll become aware of that, and then you can get into the psychiatric or psychological aspects of stress. You may not, if you're just a protein, you may just show a sort of um, a sort of selection for selectability like response. Um, but there's, you know, the, I think the two, you know the two un fundamental mechanisms, imperatives that are being fulfilled here, in accord with basic conservation laws or principles of least action from the classical perspective, um, are account for exactly the same kind of behaviour. I think the interesting thing about stress and uncertainty, though, is that we're not talking about um, the um, the content of implicit belief structures, but the 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 second order statistics, the uncertainty, uh, and that I think you know brings a whole level of analysis to the table. Because once you talk about uncertainty and representations of uncertainty um, in say internal states, um, then from a psychological perspective, you can start to talk about tension and consciousness. Um, from the point of view of an engineer, we're talking about things like Kalman gain and get, getting the estimates of noise levels, if you like, uh, correct. Um, uh, and I'm not sure what, 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 where the, if you like, the, well, let me ask. Um, from a quantum theoretic point of view, is uncertainty baked into that? Can you can you have a stressed quantum uh, quantum formulation? I'll put that out there. Well, I'll stop talking now. <laughs> yeah, just to, just to answer that question, um, if if one if one th thinks about quantum theory uh, from with a Bayesian view of probability, right, with a kind of subjectivist notion of probability, um, which, I mean, that point of view was really pioneered by Chris Fuchs, and, and now David Merman, for example, has taken it up and uh, written some very good things about it. Uh, then this notion of uncertainty reduction uh, becomes the explanation for why you do experiments and build theories and and uh, <laughs> it, it all becomes very well aligned i think with with uh, the idea of active inference and in, in fact we we wrote into that paper at the very end some remark about uh, this cubist perspective about quantum theory becoming a result, not an interpretation. Uh, when we think of, of 
quantum theory is, in a sense, a way of, of reformulating the idea of active inference. Uh, so I think they're very consistent, right? Uh, uh, a, a stressed, a stressed quantum is uh, stressed quantum system is just a system that gets uh, observational outcomes that it doesn't expect. So you know we 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 have to think of uh, such systems as having generative models and thinking about the generative model of an electron <laughs> uh, is a bit of a stretch, right? Because the electron is only characterized by mass, charge, and angular momentum. So uh, it, it can't really have expectations about much, right? An electron can have no expectations about the external electric field, for example. Uh, it can detect that, it can respond to it, but it can't predict it. And if we think about uh, something like an electron, then we can focus in on this idea that having a generative model requires having enough memory to keep a record of the most recent observation, at least the most recent one. And if you want to have a good generative model, then you better have enough memory to keep a record of quite a number of observations. And it's this memory resource that really simple things like electrons don't have. So uh, they're, they're not great predictors uh, because they don't have the memory to allow being a great predictor. And as, as both Carl and Mike were saying, um, in a sense, you, you have to have memory to be able to feel stress. You, know, you have to know that your predictions were wrong, so you have to remember what your predictions were. <laughs> uh, so memory becomes a really key component of the theory uh, once you put it into this language, uh, because the language, in a sense, forces you to to lay out assumptions about what the what the computational resources that are being required are. That wasn't very coherent, but anyway, I, I just wanted to stress the role of memory here. Perfect, thank you. Carl? Yeah, just to um, reinforce and endorse that last point, um, and uh, just tell exactly the same story in a much more pragmatic way, from the point of view of a statistician. So I heard Chris say there, basically, that if I want to go beyond being a, a little electron or a thermostat, and I want to now um, infer the quality of how noisy are my sensors, for example, my thermoresensors, if I'm a thermostat, that will require me becoming a little statistician. And what does that mean? Well, basically, I'm going to be estimating the standard error or the um the experimental variance there's something quite important about that uh, you know which which um uh, comes back exactly to the computational resources and memory if you do a simple t-test as a statistician on ex some experimental data you necessarily have to acquire lots of data points and store them and of course that is just the degrees of freedom associated with your t-test or your f-test so the degrees of freedom score the number of data points that you'll be able to remember and you need a sufficient number in order to get a precise estimate of the uncertainty so literally the degrees of freedom in classical statistics is literally a statistic that scores your confidence in the estimation of the standard error which is pooled over multiple observations which is an attempt to estimate on average, if I observe with this kind of, um, or I, um, I ask my questions, or I wrote to my holographic screen, um, I, or I um, solicited these sensory states, um, you know, 
what would uh, on average what would the uncertainty be associated with it so i think it's a really impo important point about the computational resources and the degrees of freedom literally in the sense of the degrees of freedom associated with your f test or the degrees of freedom you have available for the computing power to actually get up to these second order inference machines or takes on, on on second order inference so and i think that is particularly important when it comes back to mike's observation about stress and uncertainty and these higher order ways of making sense of the world but in this instance making a sense of sensations that are accrued over time not about the content but about the reliability or the or the precision of that content so this is a really important point Awesome. So that kind of, oh, Chris, go ahead. If, if I could just pick up on this and, and take it in, in yet another highly related direction, it's just to point out that, that all of these resources are, are energetically expensive. So if I'm going to devote uh, space in, in my state space to recording memories, <clears throat> then that's only useful if I can defend those memories against entropy, if I can keep them from decaying. So I've got to consume energy to write the memories. I've got to consume energies to energy to maintain the memories. And then I have to consume energy to read the memories and consume energy to uh, compare what I've read with what I see with my kind of current event sensors. So as we start adding these computational resources to systems, the energy budget goes way up. And uh, it's, it's another kind of thing to keep in mind as we think about these in terms of embodied forms, whether they're robots or organisms, that uh, these, these entities are extracting this free energy that they have to have to run their computations and maintain their memories and all of that from the environment. So here's, this is another input that in a sense is not sensory, but it's still having to flow through the Markov blanket. It's still having to flow through the boundary between the system and its environment. And a lot of the system's actions on its environment, its expenditures of, of um, of its own internal energy, um, are to acquire this free energy. <laughs> so, you know, we we go out and shop for groceries, make breakfast or whatever. Uh, that's stuff that we have to do to keep, to keep all of these processes running. So it ties metabolism and cognition together in a way that they aren't often tied, but that they have to be to make sense of what's going on. Great. So just on that point, um, something that we had written down as a question from last time, um, and in terms of an electron having a generative model and discussing agency, we had talked about free choice and it was brought up in the paper several times, both in terms of like any physical system having free choice. If, if one physical system has free choice, they all have free choice. They generate like they're, they're um, noise generating things, like free choice generates noise in both classical and quantum systems. And so I just was wondering if you could maybe say a few words about the difference in free choice in an electron and the difference in bet between an electron and like a human or an animal or even a cell. Um, what is that difference? And is that also related to memory? Uh, is that a question for me? A general question for anyone. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll make a couple of comments. Uh, one is, uh, remember in talking about the canonical entanglement experiment, uh, part of the description is that Alice and Bob can uh, alter the directions of their detectors 
however they want to, at, at random, independently, whatever you want to call it, during the experiment. So that's the free choice assumption, or that's called in physics the free choice assumption. And what that assumption means, it's effectively an assumption of independence. It means that there's not some common cause in the past that determines what they're going to do as they operate their detectors. And one can reformulate quantum theory uh, in terms of what's called super determinism. And super determinism is the idea that there is some common cause in the past that determines how experimenters are going to do their experiments and in particular determines how Alice and Bob are going to rotate their detectors in this EPR experiment. And uh, super determinism is kind of the ultimate non-local hidden variable. <laughs> uh, so it, um, it allows you to predict exactly what entangled pairs are going to do. And in fact, it renders entanglement a classical effect, right? It just says these, these kind of super classical correlations are present because there, there was no independence to begin with. Everything was determined from the very beginning. And if you think about, as, as mentioned last time, Newtonian physics is formulated by Laplace. It's a super determin deterministic system. Uh, so anything that happens anywhere in the universe instantly affects what's going on everywhere else in the universe. And the most, the most, current formulation of that is Bohmian quantum mechanics, where the motion of any particle depends instantaneously on the motion of every other particle in the universe. And that's how Newtonian gravity worked, right, before Einstein imposed locality by making the speed of light finite. So all of these things are, are interconnected. Assumptions about space-time, assumptions about the speed of communication, assumptions about superdeterminism, and assumptions about free choice. It's that cluster of assumptions that the so-called free will theorem in physics is about, or theorems, there are now a couple of them due, due to Conway and Koken. And uh, what those theorems show is that from a formal perspective, uh, in physics, if you assume that some system has free choice, so if you assume that some system is not subject to superdeterminism, then you have to assume that all systems have free choice in the sense that all systems are not subject to superdeterminism. So you can't limit superdeterminism to some little piece of the universe and say it only applies here. <laughs> uh, it doesn't apply anywhere else. And in particular, it doesn't apply to me. I have free choice, even though nothing else does. That's mathematically inconsistent. Um, so that's that's what what the free choice assumption means in a in a strict physical context. Thank you. Very cool. Ethan, did you have a question? I was just going to ask a little bit more about the um, the degrees of entanglement and um, whether that's different in terms of the observer's degrees and versus the like the mechanical nature of quantum mechanics degrees. Um, I think you've answered that to some extent, but uh, just just the way that that 
varying degrees of entanglement can be thought about and whether that maybe ties into how the Hilbert space is is thought about at the same time. Yeah, well, this, this assumption, or this question touches on uh, why we do everything in the paper from the point of view of a, a bipartite decomposition. So we always we always decompose into a system and its environment in the paper. Um, and there are two reasons for that. Uh, one is to keep it simple. <laughs> and the other one's to enforce the Markov blanket condition. So uh, it's entirely commonplace to do physics in an open systems framework where we talk about uh, two systems, we can call them Alice and Bob, <laughs> again, that are embedded in a common environment. And in that case, whenever you have a, a tripartite or greater, some sort of multi-particle kind of decomposition of the state space, you can talk about degrees of entanglement uh, between different systems, and you can you know, cut up the state space any way you want to and ask about the entanglement entropy of some component of it. Um, and, you, and you get these ideas of, of partial, or they call it non-monogamous entanglement. Um, and that's all well and good. It's, it's mathematically complicated. It's conceptually complicated. But in a, in a sense, it deeply violates the Markov blanket condition. Um, because in point of fact, each of us is an observer. And uh, our goal is to, to say, what does the world look like to an observer? And from Alice's point of view, uh, Bob is a decomposition of her Markov blanket, right? Alice has to actively disambiguate uh, her incoming signals into signals that she attributes to Bob as an entity and signals that she attributes to the rest of the environment as an entity. So that's an active cognitive process on Alice's part. Uh, that's what the Markov blanket condition, that's how the Markov blanket condition, in a sense, forces us to think. So uh, the Markov blanket condition itself uh, makes us take this idea of bipartite decomposition seriously. And again, Again, you can think of this in terms of, of implicit assumptions about resources. Uh, if you think in open systems terms, and so you think of Alice and Bob as as ontic entities that are that are separate from each other by a priori assumption, and separate from their environments by a priori assumption then you systematically underestimate the amount of cognition that Alice and Bob have to be doing. And so you systematically underestimate their energy consumption. And so you systematically underestimate their, their uncontrolled effect on the environment, i.e. generation of waste heat, acquisition of free energy resources, and all of that. So it's not just a philosophical difference. It's a difference that leads you to make uh, genuinely alternate predictions about things like metabolic load. So uh, that's why we do things in this bipartite framework to respect the Markov blanket condition and to uh, keep our assumptions about energy flow explicit. Can we take that to the latter sections in the paper about biological cognition? 
what are the implications for this for biological systems? Yeah, Carl? Well, um, just to pursue that sort of thought experiment where you're trying to now say you wanted to use active inference to simulate Alice and Bob observing a pair of electrons and remembering that the pair of electrons are one thing. So you now got a tripartite uh, with three Markov blankets in play. Um, and many of the issues, for example, um, the super determinism that allows some assumptions about the QRF alignments between Bob and Alice um, uh, to be in play. Um, and also the discussion of how um, Alice has to have, uh, has to contextualize sensations from Bob um, under a belief or an internal model that Bob is indeed another Markov blanket and possibly a Markov blanket very much like Alice. Uh, what you are saying is that two of these particles, Bob and Alice, have aligned QRFs that could have been aligned historically uh, under the super, which I never heard of before, but I like the word, under super determinism. Um, and that may be a prerequisite to understand the experiments that we were taken through uh, previously when looking at the third Markov blanket, which would be the, uh, the electron. Um, uh, or the two electrons, but for simplicity. Um, so um, th that, from a biological perspective, tells you th something quite um, uh, quite interesting in the sense that um, it starts to get to um, the... If it's the case that you can basically carve up a bunch of states, not in a bipartite way, but in a multipartite way, and that carving is by inserting um, Markov blankets um, to define the partition and that every, um, if you like, subset of that space now becomes internal to its own Markov blanket. So there are now no external states. All we have in play now are a set of internal states, each equipped with their holographic screen or uh, Markov blanket states that are exchanging with other internal states. Then there's some really interesting questions about how that system will evolve. Um, you know, from the point of view of the discussion we've been having, it's going to evolve and under, under the principle of unitarity to entanglement. So it's going to, from the, from a classical perspective, um, if you allow me, it's going to tend to a, a, a state of um, uh, generalized synchronization where everything collapses onto the same synchronization manifold and everything is indistinguishable there's perfect mutual predictability there's a communication of an elemental and fundamental saw so everything has basically it, everything is singing from exactly the same hymn sheet that's the natural way of things the free energy principle is just one way of describing that natural tendency um, what would that look like cognitively well it would look as if the Markov blankets were trying to learn about each other, and to the extent that they can act on each other, they're going to try and solicit um, the kinds of outcomes that would enable them to learn about each other. So we're now going to get a situation that is driven by the imperative towards mutual predictability and entanglement. Um, that's an, an illusion. Uh, we, you know, all that is actually happening is that the system is becoming entangled. But it will look as if all of these separate um, um, Markov blankets or um, um, sets of internal states are aligning in a mutually compatible way their QRS so that they can exchange and predict each other. And if there's, if you like, an odd man out, namely the pair of electrons, um, then the, you know, then there will be an asymmetry and there will be greater degrees of entanglement um, you know, for, for at multiple levels. For example, um, if they're both observing a thermostat, then the thermostat's not going to be very good at learning how to align its QRFs with Bob and Alice, but, you know, they're all going to make the best job of it. Um, ultimately, of course, with good cultural eco niche, niche construction, they'll they'll build better thermostats to become little robots, and then they can all live happily and communicate. So I think that sort of the cognitive thing here comes again back to learning to live in your world as an apparent expression of the um, the um, inevitable progression to entanglement whereby we try to learn about each other under the plausible hypothesis that you are like me 
it's not necessarily true, but it, you know, it's one hypothesis you can bring, bring to the table. You never know whether it's true or not. Um, but that's certainly one hypothesis that would work very nicely for Alice and Bob if they can develop a common language. So this notion of aligning QRFs between two blanketed systems, particles, um, that are sufficiently similar um, then just simply translates into um, learning uh, to share the same narrative, to share the same language uh, in order to render um, everything mutually predictable. So I know exactly what you're going to say next and you know exactly what I'm going to say next. And we come now to this asymptotic limit of zero prediction error, zero free energy and complete entanglement. And that would be the, you know, the object would have no Ukraines or Brexits or, or anything if we could get there. Um, but that would be the you know, the other direction of travel from a, from a biological perspective. Uh, just just to there are simulations of this from a purely classical uh, perspective. Um, start and what you normally do um, is start off with um, two systems um, that uh, think they have. Um, strange attractors, usually a Lorentz attractor. So they think that their dynamics um, are generated by the, act, the, the autonomous or the active states, um, create stuff out there that um, has um, uh, a chaotic aspect. And I, I, I say that explicitly just because this sort of the notion of free will and choice in the classical domain usually reduces to sensitivity to initial conditions, which strikes me as a homologue of the super determinism going, you know, can you go right back to the beginning and um, explain everything? Um, uh, and in sort of classical dynamical systems, there are certain situations where you can't because you get a sensitivity to initial conditions. Um, so that would leave space for uh, free will and choice, certainly at a, uh, um, you know, at, at one level. But sorry, I digress. The, um, so what you do is you basically put sort of two chaotic systems with sensitivity to initial conditions together, um, but they're not identical in the first instance. But, but if they can exchange sensory and active states or they can exchange across a shared holographic screen, so we're now back to the bipartite situation, then they will naturally, in fact, if you think about it, they can't do anything else, um, they will naturally uh, come to a state of entanglement, i.e. In, if um, uh, generalized synchrony. And if you allow the parameters of the equations of motion that underwrite these chaotic dynamic, uh, dynamics to also maximize mutual predictability or minimize free energy, then they will actually come to show an identical synchronization because they will learn to become like each other, just like Mike's robots. Um, but in this instance, they're learning about the other person simply to make things predictable. So then you will have a shared narrative. And in principle, um, you should be able to evince a kind of language. I, I, I mentioned that because I know Chris wanted to talk about language. We wanted to talk about, you know, quant quantum physics is just basically a description of, of communication and language. Uh, I, don't, I don't think we're going to have time to do that, but I thought I'd slip that in anyway. Chris, did you want to say a few words? Quantum and language. Oh uh, well, that that was that was lovely, Carl. And I I I like the idea of this kind of uh, simulation leading to to generalized synchrony. I think it's interesting from this perspective that we uh, we always divide our environment into entities like us and then at least one entity that's radically unlike us which we call the shared environment or the the open environment or the general environment or something like that and um so we have this sense of a a social grouping of similar entities uh that are commonly exposed to this vastly dissimilar entity uh, with which we don't share a common language uh, and we're not very good at predicting uh, and so on. And so we always have this kind of open systems point of view. And uh, one of the functions of 
this vastly different system with which we don't share a common language is it's our free energy source and sink. So it's where we put our waste heat and it's, it's where we get our free energy for doing computation. Um, so I, I think it's interesting to think of uh, this situation of uh, kind of local synchrony or, or local entanglement or a local language community, uh, local shared predictability uh, embedded in uh, this unpredictable, uh, chaotic, and in a sense, in principle chaotic, because it's the waste heat dump. Right? Uh, we've, we've assumed a priori that we can't understand it because it's where we're putting uh, all of our, the thermodynamic entropy that we're creating. Uh, we 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 put ourselves in a in a conceptual bind almost automatically by being systems that that have to generate this entropy and put it somewhere. So I, I like this this classical to quantum correspondence very much, and I I think it works very nicely. Awesome, Mike. Yeah, um, I want to I want to float an idea which uh, is literally just a few days old, so it may be uh, complete nonsense, but I'll, I'll float it anyway because I think it's uh, I think it's 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 relevant, and I've I've been thinking about it this way. It occurs to me that um, it, you know this this binary distinction between uh, there are agents, some of them like me, some of them different, maybe competitors, whatever. But there are, there are some agents that I can communicate with, or can I receive influence or signals from. And then, and then there's this environment, which is, you know, something that we assume, or I mean, some, some cultures, of course, don't assume that, but, but we can assume that it has very low or, or zero agency, meaning that it just is this sort of dumb, un purposeless universe, and it's on us to sort of figure out what it's doing, right? So it, it occurs to me that, that that distinction maybe shouldn't be binary, and maybe what we want to be thinking about is as an agent, when you are receiving something, uh, from from what you think is the outside, you might want to estimate uh, how, what is the agency on the other end, for, and and you might want to do this for the following reason, right? And and I started thinking about this by imagining what it would be like to be in an internal partition or a chunk of a giant neural net being trained. You know, you you live if if that's you, you live in a very mindful universe. You know, you could catch on to the fact that you know what I'm being I'm being trained for something. You know, the world like there are bigger patterns here, and of course, it moves in inscrutable ways and everything because I can't you know I can't sort of for, I can't understand the whole pattern of what's going on, but I can definitely tell that it's rewarding me and punishing me for specific behaviors, right? And of course, some people do feel that way about the universe and at large that there are patterns that uh, that are not just you know not quote unquote just physics, and so. So the reason the reason I, I think and, and this extends to, you know, we have supervised learning and unsupervised learning. And again, we think of those as kind of binary things, right? Is there some sort of intelligence on the other end telling you what's right and wrong, or is it just on you to abstract patterns from the environment? And the reason I think we th this matters is that if if uh, if if you are uh, trying to learn from the environment, meaning there's only one agent involved, there's right, there's the, the, that's you, there's one agent, and then there's this sort of un unthinking universe around you then you are pretty much guaranteed that whatever uh, whatever you can manage to infer, to, it will be to your utility. It's on you to figure out, uh, you, to learn whatever you can. If there's another agent on the other side and you are being trained, right, then uh, what are the odds that that agent has your best interests at heart? I mean, maybe, but maybe not. And so if this is some sort of supervised learning, you have to ask yourself, what is it that I'm being trained, and is it really what I what I want? Right? There's there's another there's it's kind of a whole thing that you can imagine evolutionarily that maybe to avoid uh, being hijacked by um, by 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 parasites by by you know uh, competitors by whoever you don't really want to be trainable too much. You you want to learn, but you don't really want to be trained. And so maybe the idea then is that. Uh, what if, what if, and this is, okay, this is where, you know, I really haven't, haven't uh, talked to anybody about this yet. So this is, again, could be a very amateurish stuff, but, but what if 
uh, something like back propagation or whatever, what if that literally hurts? What if as a as a right as an early creature having some sort of error function forced back through your channels as opposed to whatever you were trying to generate yourself what if that's evolutionarily designed to be unpleasant and what if uh what you're trying to do is avoid that happening you don't want to be trained you want to uh, learn on your own terms and you could sort of imagine the, the different layers of a feed forward artificial neural network where the like the initial input layer Th that that uh, sort of creature gets to see the world quote unquote as it is it gets the raw inputs the next layer and certainly the layers past that you know the ones on the right that are ab ab abstracting they're getting all kinds of propaganda filtered to them by the early layers you know they don't get to see the real inputs they get to see whatever the pre the prior layers think they should be seeing and and so maybe if you don't have a flat network like this but maybe what you have is a um, you know, more biologically, you have a um, kind of a nested um, uh, multi-scale kind of system. Maybe there's some sort of um, incentive for the middle layers to try to sort of crawl leftward so that they have more raw access to the real world and not be trapped uh, being being fed by these other agents, right? So again, you know, this is all very qualitative stuff, but you get the idea. That's that's kind of what uh, what 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 I was thinking about. Nice. Dean and then Daniel. Mike, if you want to chat about this, this is what I was doing for about 10 years, unleashing and getting out of the lab and getting past the toy model. So perhaps cool. we should chat about this for a bit. Can I just, a couple of things. Uh, Chris, first of all, thank you for, uh, I feel like I've come away with a Munich Stein volume worth of of coolness for the last two weeks, just listening to you explain these really com well complicated things to me uh, in ways that I can actually understand. Um, one of the things that I'm, I'm I'm still kind of curious about is once we let things out of the lab and we keep them in that variability retained space, and we're and we don't want to be in conflict with sort of the basic rules of of what quantum information tells us. I want to kind of go back for one second to what Stephen was kind of closing the 40.1 with, and that is what do we do when we look at things in, in that sort of relational realm that a lot of um, in, in, in indigenous cultures sort of take up and try to find themselves within. And I'm kind of leading to this idea that there's, there's a sort of a subject matter generalist that leads to a prediction matter expert down the road. And I, I talked to Carl, I, it was my question to Carl back in June when he was talking to us in the active inference lab. And so without getting into any kind of conflict with the quantum aspects of this, um, what 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 do we take out with, with us when we go on a bike ride with, with Chris Fields that's, that's quantum related, that isn't in conflict with everything we've talked about today, but gives us a better confidence around the things that we might encounter and predict. What do you take on your bike, Chris? <laughs> yeah, what's in your quiver? <laughs> yeah. yeah, good question. Uh, you know, Once again, these, these theoretical frameworks are languages and they, their role is to shape our concepts or they are ways of shaping our concepts. And um, I, th I think the, the fundamental kind of lesson of quantum theory for us is to not take the boundaries we see uh, as literally as we're encouraged to do in the classical worldview. I'll, I'll try to distinguish the classical worldview from classical physics because 
classical physics by itself, uh, again, going back to someone like Laplace, um, is a physics of, of atoms, <laughs> which, are, which are, you know, sort of elemental. Uh, it's not a physics of bounded macroscopic objects. The boundaries, even in classical physics, are sort of arbitrary. And I, I think that's what quantum theory is trying to tell us to, is trying to tell us that these these are boundaries that we draw on our blankets, and I think this is in a sense what uh, thinking about the FEP is trying to tell us that that we have to take this notion that we're blanketed entities seriously when we think about what we're interacting with which is, you know, everything but us. Daniel? In our closing minutes, um, if we could just each give a thought, this is really just a special and very powerful uh, conversation. Uh, Mike with a back propaganda, amazing thought <laughs> experiment <laughs> there. Um, and uh, no boundary and quantum questions touching on the work of like Ken Wilber. And I think it's just so powerful about um, does someone have the whole world in their hands? Is that a good person? Is it a bad person or thing? What kind of thing is that? Who's on the other side of this video call? Who's on the other side of that other side? What's the bigger picture? And it really brings it home that, no, it's not just about electrons. This is something that is across scales and systems. So really just wanted to appreciate the paper and hope that we continue on this line of development. And I'll pass it to Stephen. Uh, thanks, Daniel. Yeah, I was gonna tie this a little bit, some of the threads with, um this challenge of having this false sense of certainty in our culture and how it does feel uncomfortable to be trained um, but we do it in the West because we're confident that we've got this expert knowledge but then we suddenly find out we don't know as much as we do know or we think we know so that may be why bottom-up sort of organic indigenous kind of ways of being or ways of sensing can feel more holistic. So I think there might be something quite powerful in that. So I, I like that thread and I think that ties together with um, the challenges in practice when we try to, to train up communities, especially if we're working, say if I've worked in rural Africa and communities there, that if they don't feel connected to the, the colonizing narrative, it feels very oppressive. So there's, you know, there's a lot of good points there around where is their coherence, where there's decoherence, and also where's their certainty and where there's uncertainty. So thanks, this is really helpful. And um, I'll pass it over to Blue. Well, I've said enough. I think uh, I'd like to hear from Mike or Carl or Chris about where where you're going or what you're taking away or or what what are your final thoughts about the discussion we've had over the last couple of weeks i mean i guess i guess the only thing i'll say is that uh to, to me I, I i really like um this idea that it it turns on its head this this notion that uh, that you have this 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 massive amount of uh, mindless stuff and then somehow you know a little bit of mind shows up at the end that 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 kind of turns it upside down and and if that's the case then it becomes th then the scaling problem is is really really interesting right is how how you scale you know how how biology manages to scale these things so that they become synergistic synergistic and bigger and bigger as opposed to you know just merely a bigger pile of rocks than than the previous pile of rocks and so that uh right so so those those mechanisms and in particular in biology and and so you know I, I look at it from from cells getting together to be organisms and solving problems in the anatomical space but but i think there we actually have uh some pretty good 
um, alternative, uh, although very, very, uh, very similar in many ways, isomorphic, but alternative stories to what happens in neuroscience to try to understand how that scaling actually works. So I'm super, I'm, I'm just super, super excited about that. And also the role of the observer and all of this, and the idea that all of this is based on various observers observing each other. And I think that makes it, it, it makes for a lot of uh, progress and, and fewer pseudo problems when you, when you look at it that way. Carl or Chris, any final thoughts? Well, I'll, I'll just thank you guys again for putting this together. I thought this was a fascinating conversation. And, uh, you know, if I could throw one more thing into it, I, I, I think conversations like this are, are evidence for uh, the the kind of disciplinary siloization that's been forced onto us by academic tradition being an artifact and not necessarily being all that useful. Thanks so much. Carl, we're going to leave you with the final word. Ah, uh, good. Well, <laughs> it has to be a thank you, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> For you lot for putting this together and, and for the brilliant uh, um, didactic and also challenging uh, didactic uh, unpacking of some really um, challenging but I think revealing issues and also the brilliant questions. Um, my final word will be future pointing. I'm um, just taking up, um, taking up the sleeve of Chris's, you know, that having unsiloed conversations is useful. Just think, thinking about Mike having the balls to come up with his brand new hypothesis that's two years old. So two days old, my apologies. So I thought it was really interesting. Just a, a nice example of putting things into this kind of discussion, which we're all going to go and think about. So my immediate thought was, um, how on earth does the second layer in a variational autoencoder or something doing backprop act? Um, and of course, it can act if, it, if it's a recurrent neural network and it can select which of the um, the lowest level neurons or hidden layer, uh, sorry, not the non-hidden layer uh, uh, units uh, to listen to. Um, and of course, we come back again exactly to attention and selecting those sources of precise information um, where you've got a kind of internal action. So uh, an interesting and silly thought, but just a nice example of how talking together can, can excite interesting and, 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 and uh, potentially useful or possibly silly, silly thoughts. But again, thank you. Wonderful. I had a great time observing all of you um, and hope to get to do more of it in the future. Yep, we can have a dot three anytime. Consider 40 um, in the uh, intermeasurement interval while our igus is digesting. And uh, talk to you all soon. Thanks again. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. It's great.